Welcome back to the Step Through, a weekly show about the WNBA, hosted by myself, Sabrina Merchant, and Evan Gualberto. This is episode one of season two of the 2022 WNBA season. I got to tell you, there's a lot of reasons that I'm excited about this particular year of WNBA basketball, but chief among them, talking about the W with you, Evan. I'm so excited to be back. I'm super excited to be back. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about this on the pod, but you spent portions or at least one portion of your off season with certain WNBA legends. I don't know if you want to talk about it, but we, we could save that for another time. <laughs> Got to sprinkle that in teams. organically, you know, you know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but anyway, if you are interested in reading my actual like, coverage about the WNBA, that is all moved to swishappeal.com at SP nation, where I am now the national director of women's basketball coverage at SB nation. So that's pretty cool. Link below. More people covering WNBA is always a good thing. Anyway, uh, it's been two weeks since the season started. You and I had planned to record last week, but uh, as things happen, we're unable to. But uh, just the first thing that jumped out to me over the first two weeks of this season is, hey, a number one pick that's pretty good. (laughs) Ryan Howard, how about Ryan Howard? I got to say, when I found out that Mike Tebow was willing to trade out of the number one spot to not draft Ryan Howard... I kind of agree with Tebow. I was like, oh, he must know something because like excellent evaluator of talent. I like the way the Mystics roster is built quite a bit. Why would you not want a generational talent like Ryan Howard? And it's not like the pick that they got in addition, like that second round pick is like some huge franchise altering thing. Unfortunately, Kristen Williams out for the season as is, you know, the player that was selected by Washington at that pick. I think we can like already eliminate Mike Tebow from executive of the year conversation this year because of that trade, because Holy moly, Ryan Howard, like first got a good look at her during the Sparks dream game a couple weeks or like a a week back. She can kind of already do everything on the basketball court. Like I don't have a lot of specific things to say about her yet other than, oh my God, the difference between her and Charlie Collier is stark. (laughs) It is stark. It just, it sucks. Like when you get the number one pick, like there are some drafts that are like the Asia Wilson lottery and some drafts that are not the Asia Wilson lottery. And for the Atlanta dream to get this player, who is personable, who is marketable, who plays just incredibly appealing basketball and who seems to really like being there. This rebuild is off to a fantastic start under Tanisha Wright and Dan Padover. Like kudos to the dream for pouncing on this opportunity. Kudos to Ryan Howard for absolutely kicking ass through her first two weeks of the WNBA season. And like, I guess the rookie of the year race is over. I don't know, but... Like a lot of things seem possible for Atlanta that didn't before. And it is legitimately all because of this one player. Yeah. Not great that my very first thing is, yeah, I got nothing, but she's, she's unbelievable. I guess the only thing I should ask you is like, what are the odds that she is an all-star? Hmm. Okay. So we did have this uh, round table of predictions of like, who would be a first time all-star this year. And none of us at SB Nation were brave enough to go with a rookie. I went with Alicia Gray, uh, which I'm feeling like Jackie Young is probably the right answer at this point. But I kind of think it's like one more week of this and it's a done deal. Because just the, the confirmation bias of the start of the season is, is so strong. Like that anchoring effect, you know, like you pick some, like you think of someone as good at the start of the year. And then it's just so hard to go away from that prior, you know. So if she just has like a three week stretch of just kicking everyone's ass, like which, you know, two thirds of the way there already for Ryan Howard. I find it hard to believe that she's going to be left off in all-star team. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I, I learned my lessons last season. I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to make bold predictions about players who look great week one, week two. Um, mm-hmm. But no, she, she legitimately does look fantastic. Like her, her change of pace, her footwork, her ability to just, I mean, already a three-level scorer which is like right a difficult thing in one a rookie but two like a rookie who has the ball in their hands like a lot of the time shooting off the dribble it's really impressive too like just I mean the that sparks game where they were just running pick and rolls with Liz and drop and just getting good shots every single time like it's it's very impressive right away uh I made some comments about the Atlanta Dream roster at the start of the season that I probably should take back, but there's a lot of interesting pieces there and it just, it all looks so much better when you have like that generational superstar to build around. And I really do believe that we're talking about a generational superstar and that's pretty cool. 
because uh, the last couple drafts were lacking in that type of play. Or at present, we have not seen that type of player in the last couple of drafts. Let me put it that way. Do you want to transition to other rookies? Yeah, more rookies. So I got to say, like, how much time did we even spend talking about rookies last year? I, I don't even know. Like, we may have briefly dived into the Awak, Queer, Charlie Collier, like, debate in Dallas. I don't even know. But Indiana has five rookies on their roster this year, like a five rookie lineup that could legitimately start, not because like they're good enough to start, but because like positionally makes sense to start. Uh, I just love uh, the fact that like there are, you know, more than one rookie who I'd consider as like a long-term, you know, star type prospect from this class. And Indiana has a couple of them. Uh, I personally took Melissa Smith as my rookie of the year preseason. Uh, I don't feel bad about it necessarily. I mean, she is one of, four players in the WNBA averaging a double double at the moment. Evan, do you want to guess who the other three are? Well, sure. I'll, I'll take a shot. Um, <laughs> I mean, Syl, um, Sylvia. That's Fowles, one. I think, mm-hmm. I think it has to be. Um, and I'm going to, yeah, I think, I think Asia Wilson is. That is two. Very good. Um, and then question mark. <laughs> question mark. Um, dear can be. Huh. And if we rounded, Jessica Shepard would be another one. <laughs> 9.8 rebounds per game. So a lot of rebounds coming from two teams. But yeah, uh, th- I mean, obviously, like those baseline statistical markers are not what you want to determine if a player is good or not. But she just looks super comfortable already uh, scoring, like not even that efficiently yet. And that's still putting up a lot of numbers. Um, the fever are minus 40 for the season and they're uh, sorry, that was a, a different fever rookie that I wanted to talk about, but yeah, Melissa Smith looks really good. Um, her Baylor counterpart who I just, uh, you know, got a little ahead of myself with Queen Egbo, the most disrespectful blocks in the league. Like we spent a lot of time talking about Nia coffee and her help side blocks last year. Uh, Queen Egbo got Nia twice in one game against the dream last week. They were awesome. She had two blocks on Nako Gumake on the same possession, just like solid positional defense against a player I would say has some of the best footwork in the WNBA. And this is a rookie who just had no regard for that. She had one block on aerial powers. Like the way she celebrates afterwards, I just, I feel it. <laughs> I want to be a part of it. And you, you really feel like there is a solid future front court with her and Melissa Smith going forward in Indiana. And that's, that's very cool because again, not a lot to write home about from last year's fever team. Clearly, like they only have like four players left over from that roster. But I like that front court so very much. This is one where um, the fever are minus 40 this year. They're plus 19 with Queen Egbo on the court. So that's pretty cool for a rookie to have that level of impact for a team that is, you know, still near the bottom of the WNBA standings, but already having a positive impact is, is pretty awesome. And then, you know, Destiny Henderson, like, We spent some time talking about her offline, just like for the NCAA tournament, the way she lit it up for South Carolina. You could tell me that she was a point guard in this league for five years already. And I believe you just the way that she has that poise and that comfort running the offense already. Uh, Her pull-up looks awesome. I mean, just like, how how did she fall to number 20, Evan? Do you have any answers for me? I don't understand how she was the 20th pick in this year's draft. I don't. I, I, I genuinely don't. I think we were... Yeah, I don't think we were alone when we were talking about how confused we were that she just she just kept dropping. She was invited to the green room. It doesn't make any sense to me because she, you know, spark plug defensively, obviously. And I think um, based on the tournament, like you could see things would translate or as safe a bet as any in terms of translating. But I just, it, it, yeah, I don't I don't know. I mean, she was the best player in a national title game that featured Aaliyah Boston and like Paige Beckers, and, like players who are in the WNBA right now, like Olivia Nelson and Toda and Athena Westbrook. I mean, she's, she's awesome. I mean, I just, the, the joy that I get watching her play is so diametrically opposed to the feeling I got watching the fever a year ago. I'm just very happy that they have a player who has that kind of vibe for one thing and who clearly enjoys this responsibility of like being on the fever. It's pretty cool. Um, just three rookies who like are already doing great things. You know, Emily Engsler, I haven't seen everything out of yet. Like I have high hopes. Like there are plays where you see 
the flashes start to be there. Like she's, she's not scoring very well yet, but that's fine. Like the scoring was the last thing to come for her in college too. And I, I hope that the fever give her time to grow, but I still, you know, believe in that pick quite a bit. I'm not sure I believe in the Lexi Hall pick, which is disappointing because like if she had been taken at number 20 and Destiny Henderson had been taken at number six, I probably would have very different views about this, which is unfair because they're both on the fever. Now they both made the team draft position really doesn't matter at this point, but like I saw people who didn't even ever mocked in like the first two rounds of the draft. So just, you know, hope she gets some time. Loved her at Stanford. She was great. Um, that five player grouping, I think is going to be thought of together a lot just because you don't often get a five player rookie class on the same team. So, you know, she's, she's got some time to figure out how to make her mark, but for now, the rest of the class is very much holding it down for the fever. And that's awesome because again, like the 2021 rookies were blah, like on every sense of the word. And just like, if we only had the Indiana rookie class, it'd be better than 2021. Ooh. Complete 180 from last season, right? So just talking about the fever in a positive light, not actively avoiding them, talking about them on week one. Well, actually, I guess we talked about them on week during week one last year because never mind. It's fine. Um no, I, I too am a big believer in the I mean what I've seen in the in the four that I've seen be productive. Um don't quite know about Lexi Hall yet. I know you and I are both big fans um, dating back to college, which, you know, wasn't that long ago, but um, Emily Engsler, like what I've seen, the flashes I've seen as like a, a high post operator, like I think only her second three of the season or one of her two threes on the season was she got the ball entered to her, like at about the slot area, fake handoff with it. I believe it was Kelsey Mitchell and then steps mm-hmm. back to pull a three like if you're telling me that's something we can see develop out of her and you know obviously the defense is it's, it's always been there it's always going to be there I just, yeah i'm i'm really excited about indiana oh it's so <laughs> hard to say truly i cannot remember when or why we would have talked about the fever a year ago um the archives do exist maybe i could find out but i th- i think they're going to be a team that we're com- going to come back to because They just have so many exciting pieces for the future and they play a style of basketball that like, I'm not completely opposed to anymore. (laughs) That revenge game, you know, for Crystal Dangerfield against the Lynx was really nice. I I don't expect we're going to see her back in a fever uniform this year, but the way they all like celebrated her in that moment, like a player who they'd known for like all of five days, like that had been on the roster. I just, thought was really cool. And that's the kind of moment we just didn't see with fever last year, just the joy, you know, the excitement to actually be there. I think it's cool. I am. I'm here for the Lynn Dunn second era in Indiana. I think it's good. Thanks. But, you know, moving on from something that you would never expect me and Evan to talk about to something that you really should expect me and Evan to talk about is another group of five players who have been awesome to start this season. And that is the 2018, sorry, the 2019 Notre Dame draft class of Rika Gumbawale, Jessica Shepard, Brianna Turner, Jack Young, and Marina Mabry, four of whom actually got extensions this off season, you know, to remain with their current teams. Just thinking about the number of players who don't make it like from the draft onto a team. And then the ones who like make it a year and then get cut like right away that like, it's only been what their, their fourth seasons with their current teams, but like just to have that level of longevity for five players from the same school in the same draft class is pretty nuts. Um, and they all look really good like it's not just like oh they had to hold on to them because of cap mechanics or whatever like Arike Gunawale puts up uh what, like 37 or 39 on Phoenix the other night just unabashed getting to the basket I mean her scoring is is what it is like she's Arike she's got that max extension for a good reason um she's gonna make the all-star team I'm positive of it she's gunning for that world cup roster she's gunning for the next Olympic team I I nothing new for me about Arike I don't know about you Evan but like the the player that I saw last year, she just looks like a supercharged version of that to start the year. Yeah, it seems to me it's just it's just a little easier. Obviously, there's a there's a level of comfort there. You know, it's we know what to expect from Dallas. Um, and there's kind of it's when you figure out your flow and the fact that you know the ball is gonna be in your hands X, Y, and Z, 
moments in the game, you're going to get X amount of usage, X amount of reps. Yeah, I, I think just the familiarity and the fact that she knows there's there's really nothing anybody can do against her like 10 times out of 10. Like you can occasionally get a stop, but right. she'll figure it out. She, like you said, she's more supercharged now. And I think, yeah, the only way is forward with her. I think the next big thing with Arike is trying to see how she holds up in a series because on a day-to-day regular season basis, I don't think teams are going to try to scheme to stop her, you know, when there are all those other weapons on the Dallas wings and just not enough time really to game plan for any one particular opponent, but to have that happen over multiple games against the same team. And I know Arike had said that she was really excited for playoff series because she didn't feel like she was really in the playoffs last year with just the one and done against Chicago. So that's the next thing. I mean, I realized we're like three months away from that, but when you get a player of her level, like that's, that's what you want to see. Um, and then we've got her teammate, Marina Mabry, the only one of the Notre Dame five to not get an extension, but who's just been like her most Marina self, I would say this year, uh, getting into a little dust up with Diana Tarazi. Um, you mentioned before we started recording, uh, her, her soccer esque flop, you know, from, uh, an interaction with diamond to shields, but then like, she obviously goes a- and like has 10 assists against Phoenix and hits what I would consider the dagger on a, you know, a nice long mid-range jumper to put the wings up six at the end of the game. Her command again, just seems like she's like super in control. You know, I'm not sure that Dallas considers her the long-term partner to Rike Gunbowale. Like they've tried a lot of options next to Rike. We've gone through Mariah Jefferson. They still have Ty Harris. They just drafted Veronica Burton. Um, Marina by my money is still the best option next to her, but again, not a traditional point guard, but I think Dallas is going to realize that, that she's the one who belongs next to Enrique. And I'm, I'm interested how like Marina can prove that over the course of these upcoming 30 games. Yeah. I mean, if you watched last season, we, we raved about Marina um, just as relentless a gunner um, in terms <laughs> of how like without conscience she is, about getting shots up. But yeah, I mean, I, they're a match made in heaven, the two of them. Not necessarily the perfect pair defensively, but like two of them together, just things are going to happen on the court. Are they going to be good <laughs> things? Who knows? But fun things happen. Interesting things happen when the two of them are together. Yeah, and I, I like the defensive like potential of Dallas a lot more when you've got Alicia Gray and Satu at the three and four to just you know, hide some of the, the weaknesses that may happen with that perimeter pairing. But like, I don't think Marina's a bad defender necessarily. Like she's not a one-on-one stopper. She's got good size for her position. I mean, she definitely gets into opponents. Like that's, that's part of it. But yeah, there, there's some reasons why I can see why Dallas is like not sold on that duo yet, but I think it's the way to go. I, I truly do. Um, I, I had an opportunity to talk to Riga over the off season and I asked for like where Marina ranks on like the, the bad shot maker list. <laughs> Um, and she's like, the way I see it, you know, none of the shots Marina takes are bad shots. I think they're all going. <laughs> I mean, if anyone's going to say that, it's going to be Arike, right? <laughs> <laughs> One, she's being a great teammate. Two, Arike has never taken a bad shot in her life. No, no. If, if you, you acknowledge me. that Marina is taking bad shots and all of a sudden your shot diet warrants a little more scrutiny, which nobody wants that. Um, all right. So we've got, got the two Notre Dame guards. Next up, uh, Jackie Young, we mentioned earlier as a potential first time all-star. I, I don't know what it is about Jackie. She has just worn me down over these last two years. Uh, I did not think much of her when the aces drafted her, you know, we obviously think very highly of Nafisa Collier on this podcast. That was a player who was taken below Jackie in that draft. And, you know, it's just a, a decision that I'll be thinking about for a very long time, much like I imagine Ryan Howard and Shakira Austin, but the way she wears you down, like that's literally her game on the court. She just freaking bullies whoever is guarding her because she is so big. She's so physical at that forward position. I think about how the aces have modernized their offense under Becky Hammond versus Bill and beer. And really it's all that spacing just creates even more opportunities for them to get into the paint because that's the way Kelsey Plum and Jackie Young want to attack. They want to just get to the basket. And when you have Derek Hamby and Asia Wilson out at the four and five, it's just so much harder to help when she's attacking the rim. And my goodness, does she attack the rim? She is a freaking bully. Like she is so tough to guard. She just consistently getting to the line. I'm thinking about that first half that they played against the mystics, which, you know, instantly was their only loss of the year, but she could not be stopped like by anybody who the mystics put at her in that first half before, like, you know, they inevitably ran out of gas in the second half, but like 
you just, she seems like so unassuming, right? Like she's a very quiet player. You know, she, she just looks not like super aggressive off the court. And then you just put the ball in her hands and like, oh my God, she's a freight train coming at the rim, get out of her way. And it's, it's a scary thing to think about all of those options on the Vegas offense. Like, I think I read a stat that in their five wins this season, all five of their starters have scored in double figures, which what like that's my goodness. Is that a democratized offense? But I really do believe that she's been the primary beneficiary of this Becky Hammond change because of just all the space that she gets to work with. Like, I mean, we talked about her, I mean, before we even had this podcast, like about her in the 2020 playoffs where she was just like working in that little coat closet in the paint with like everybody on the aces in that same area. And she was still doing her thing and getting to the basket, but it's just, it's so much easier. It's so much more fluid now. Um, it's like another very deserved extension that I think might even look undervalued as soon as next year for the aces. Just, I'm just going to throw this out there, leave it as a question for another time, but for the viewers to think about what are the odds that we see five Las Vegas aces? Because that's, I mean, as soon as you go away from those five, it just, as much as I love Plaisance, Quantum Williams, like they go as those five go. Um, right. And if that's going to be addressed in the future, great. But mm-hmm. as of right now, like those five are scoring double figures. Like like you said, you throw out these stats and the, the pace they play at, how are you going to leave any one of them off when like the success is tied to, I mean, all of them? Yeah. How great is it when a team just starts their five best players, you know? <laughs> What a concept. God, how dare you? This close to what a concept. Bill Lambier appreciation. How dare you? Uh, another unheralded thing about Jackie Young, part of a defensive effort that held Caleb McBride scoreless last night for the Lynx, which I mean, get you a player who can do it on both ends. Like that's she's she's great. Should we no, I guess uh, yeah, there's only there's only one more player left on this list, yeah, I mean, right? As long as we're talking about the Lynx, right? Uh yeah. we should mention their new point guard. <laughs> Jessica Shepard, uh, who just happens to be like power forward size, but hey, uh, who am I to quibble with the Cheryl Reeve offseason, which has just provided me endless source of confusion and uh, despair and entertainment over the past two weeks. <laughs> like when you can cut Crystal Dangerfield and Leisha Clarenton to sign Odyssey Sims, notably Mercur- Mercurial Odyssey Sims, you got to do it. And then when she and Angel McCautry are basically her primary ball handlers for the first five games, you're like, nah, that's not going to work for either of you. Even though Angel's on a protected contract, when you have just hideous salary cap for the next two years, then Jessica Shepard turns into your primary point guard. And you know how much I I love a good high-low action. And Jess operating out of the high post and just finding cutters throughout the Minnesota offense. I mean, I trust her with the ball in her hands as much as I do anybody else on Minnesota at this point right now, which admittedly not a high bar to clear, but can you imagine where the links would be without her at this point? Like, I know they're already like what one in five, one in four, but like they at least look competent over the last couple games, which I, I said this earlier, I'm not going to bet against a Cheryl Root team. I just, I've seen too many instances of where she gets just something good to happen out of nothing. But like, this is like an exercise and like just trying to figure out how, how low they can go before coming back. But thankfully, thankfully, Shep is there. And it's just another example of how the WNBA doesn't have these stories of rookies getting to figure it out, you know, like after coming in slowly. Like not to say that she had a bad rookie season by any means because she tore her ACL eight games into the year and was unable to play for the next couple of years. But you don't get that developmental opportunity on a lot of teams around the league, right? You get hurt, you get cut, and then you're stuck. But like Minnesota kept her around all of this time and she's a real player. Like she's a nice compliment to Sylvia Fowles. Just again, an excellent facilitator at her position, rebounds the crap out of the ball. You just like to see that type of growth arc possible for WNBA players. And it's more of a rarity than I would like. So I think I'm even more like predisposed to just root for Jess because of where she's come from. But then also like, hell yeah, she's like really good at basketball and it's cool to watch. An interesting stat, like I, I didn't even realize it. Obviously I recognize that she is big, but Jess Shepard is second on the links in rebounds, like just behind Sill, like just, just behind her and leads the team in assists obviously i mean it's a low bar but yeah i asked you this before the pod is is she actually truly genuinely a a point guard or a ball handler or a facilitator yes she is and yeah she looks you know the circumstances are dire but she looks great um and 
like I was mistaken. There's one more player. There's one more player. <laughs> yeah, but somebody who you know is is less comfortable with the ball. I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just trying to think of if Brianna Turner had half of the offensive responsibility that Jess Trevor does, like just the number of turnovers that would be spilling out of the Phoenix offense. I haven't seen Turner play as much as I would have liked this season so far, just because she started the year overseas. She missed the first couple of games. Um, Phoenix has been a, it's been a rough watch. Um, a lot of, a lot of fun Diana moments, but when you, we have to play without Skylar Diggins, when you're already without Brittany Griner, it's, I'm, I'm saving my Phoenix watching for a little bit later down the year, but like, Hey, uh, just, just looking at the numbers, you know, Turner is the only player on Phoenix with a defensive rating below 100. You know, the more things change, the more things just never change. And she's taking about three and a half shots per game. Maybe we can get her the ball a little bit more often. Like I know that Sandy Brondello had this lovely lob set between Skylar Diggins Smith and Brianna Turner, perhaps dig that out of the playbook again, you know, when Skylar is playing, obviously, but yeah, she has to just assume some more offensive responsibility. I'm looking at that extension and like, if it's all defensive value, great, but teams just sack off of her like nobody's business um, in the playoffs. Like we saw that the way Chicago did. So there, there needs to be some improvement on that side of the ball. Luckily, she's got such a strong foundation on the other side of the ball, but at the end of the day, like you just got to score points and she has to do some of that. <laughs> just, just a little bit. I, I got nothing. I, I wish, I wish. Yeah. Phoenix has been a, a real rough watch. I, think um the very first game i committed to doing a live thread of was um aces mercury and um i ended up watching overtime um the sky um sparks overtime and then by the time i switched over it was the game was over yeah um yeah so i so the same thing happened i was i was out that night so i recorded the game on nba tv um the the aces mercury game to watch later and because i'm in the la market like the first 30 minutes was blacked out because they had run the sky sparks game over right and so i turned the game on and like literally once my recording started like it's oh jackie young getting to the rim over and over again oh this is what's been happening for the first 12 minutes of game action a game that turner did not play in to be fair but I'm curious to see how this Turner Charles dynamic works. Um, it doesn't look super copacetic so far. Uh, when I spoke to Tina Charles, like after she had signed with Mercury, uh, most of the questions were naturally about her fit with Brittany Griner, because at the moment we were unaware of the situation with her detainment. But I asked her like how she saw her partnership with Brianna Turner working. And she just sort of looks at me and just like, my partnership with Brianna Turner. And I was like, you have literally given this no thought. <laughs> <laughs> but hey 30 more games to go i'm sure they can figure something out all right was there anything you wanted to get to evan before we get to our game of the week nope excited no. to i mean speaking of partnerships right um yeah. yeah we can we can just go into our game of the week <laughs> so no no spark joy this year i guess <laughs> when when we start figuring out what the end of game sets like are supposed to look like um, the experience of being a Sparks fan has just been a steady decline since the start of the season. I had such high hopes after that sky win. Um, and then to take care of business against Indiana, the Atlanta loss didn't even really bother me because, you know, it was a well hard fought game. I just, I'm making more excuses for them than I thought I would at this point of the year. So, uh, we'll, we'll see how that, how that works. Out. Hey, you're not the only one. There are certain people in the, Never mind, It's fine. Like, <laughs> Um, I will say that I would like to see the black jerseys back for the Sparks, the Rebel jerseys from last year with the stars on the side. I thought those were excellent, uh, really good look. I think the Sparks are one of, got to be only a couple teams that haven't busted out their Rebels this year yet, but I would like to see those back. Um, really a big fan of the hoodies that Becky Hammond and the Aces coaching staff wear. If the Aces sell those, I, I need to get them because they're really cool. <laughs> Um, in general, just a big fan of all of the swag that WNBA coaches have been wearing this season. The looks have been a lot sharper than they were a year ago. I don't know why that is. Maybe they're just better prepared for the situation of not having to wear, you know, formal wear. Um, and then also for our game of the week, which was Seattle and Chicago um, this past Wednesday, Noel Quinn's dress. Fantastic. <laughs> that is a look that I also want. Just really, you know, 
good stuff from the coaches. I know like most of the style columns about the WNBA tend to focus on the players. I get that. Uh, the coaches have been really good this year. Really good. Yeah. Let's get a tunnel um, WNBA fits for the coaches. Yeah. <laughs> Just, you can rank them the, the James Wade quarter zip. Yeah. I, James I'm Wade a is very, of. very solid, you know, simple quarter zip. Uh, Fish has mixed it up a little, a little bit. He was a pretty, pretty standard quarter zip adopter a year ago. So he's, he's expanding his range a little bit this year. I like that coach LT on the sparks goes with the the same spark swag as everybody else, but then wears a blazer on top of it. I've thought about this a lot, Evan. I, I realized this is not what you thought we were getting into. I apologize. I heard, I heard expanding his range and I, yeah, that's probably the only time we'll hear that on the pod. So, you know, I'm glad we heard it. <sighs> How many starting lineups do you think the sparks will have this year out of 36 games? Let's just put an over under right now. We're at four in five games. Let's go back to the quarter zip talk. I can't. <laughs> All right. Uh, speaking of Noel Quinn's dress, which was really the star of this week, uh, our game this week was Seattle Storm versus the Chicago side. I thought it'd be a good idea to spend some time with the defending champs, even though Kalia Copper is not back or she had not returned to the sky by the time of this game. As far as I understand, we're recording on Friday. She's back in the U.S. She's practicing with the team today. So Copper will be playing very soon. My fantasy team is very excited about that. Uh, but it is interesting to watch Chicago work with this three big lineup while they wait for Copper to come back. Um, in theory, Misa Min, Candace Parker, and Azari Stevens together provides you really with everything you'd need from that wing position because Misa Min is an excellent shooter. Uh, Candace doesn't really get guarded out there, neither does Stevens, but they can both make that shot when, you know, given the space at the three-point line. And then Stevens just has really good lateral mobility. Like I kind of trust her on wings as much as anybody else on the roster when Copper's not around. So it was, it was fun to watch that three big group work. Um, but then a little disappointing when James Wade was like at the start of the second half, now nah, I'm going to go with Rebecca Gardner instead of Asbury Stevens, because one just love watching Asbury Stevens play. Like arguably she had the best game out of any of those three in that one against Seattle. And then two, it's just a little less, interesting when you just put a conventional small forward out there instead of the the fun three big lineup because I mean the the great thing about watching Chicago play is that I think they're more creative offense than just about anybody in the W and them making it work with three bigs was far more interesting than just you know plug and play for someone who is is not Khalid Copper like I mean I think the most telling stat from that game was that Seattle had 13 turnovers by the end of the third quarter and Chicago had not scored off of any of them, which you think Chicago, you think transition offense and the fact that they could not make anything happen out of one Seattle turnover was astounding. Just, I mean, that's where you'd miss copper more than anything else, but I am uh, rambling a bit about just random things with this Chicago offense when Seattle actually won the game. Uh, Evan, was there anything that stood out to you from the storm in this particular game? Steph Talbot, <laughs> the Steph Talbot, as he Magregor, um, just whew. like um, the way they exploited. Well, not so much Steph Talbot from a scoring standpoint, but we can talk more about her later. Um, I mean, as he was the leading scorer for the storm this game, I believe, and I, the game overall, I'm not sure if that's right. Check. That is correct. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, but yeah, the, just the way she, I mean, she had a dominant first half and the way she just like wiggles into space and she just those like doesn't touch the ball with her other hand scoops where she's shielding it across her body, you know, just was able to find the spaces when Chicago was in their like hard hedge, just, just great stuff. But I think, and I mean, um, I've seen your game notes about this. But like my favorite part of um, Ezzy's game, that game was actually her passing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was going to mention her pick and roll like chemistry with Jewel Lloyd. I thought it was really good. Lloyd, for some reason, like I thought she had an excellent game. And then I looked at the box score and was surprised to see just how little counting stats were there because I thought she had a really good floor game just in terms of using her scoring to just like leverage some passing opportunities. And then those passes to Ezzy were just right on point. Um, but yeah, Ezzy like, 
I think one of the things that I was worried about with the Seattle offense with Mercedes Russell out was that I think Mercedes Russell has a good sense of just functioning out of the elbow and passing, you know, which has never really been as he's strong suit. Um, but she passes a little bit more on the move, which is makes more sense because she's just more of a mobile big than Mercedes Russell is. Uh, and I think the one that really stood out to me was this drive and dump that she had to Rashonda Gray in the fourth quarter where like, that's a play that guards make. That's not a play that your tallest player on the court, your center makes because one, the drive to the basket, just collapsing the defense on her and then finding that little pocket of space to another big, just really nice stuff. Um, Rashonda Gray, I, I'm just perpetually fascinated by her because like she's so physical and, and, and this has happens to just every player who like spends five seconds on the sparks. So I become perpetually fascinated by, but I'm not getting why John tell Lavender is there. I really don't understand. <laughs> but every time Rashonda Gray is on the court, I'm like, yeah, she gets offensive rebounds. She just gets in the middle of things. I like just watching her fight in the middle of paint. Um, and then that positioning, you know, to be that recipient to that as he passed was really, really great. Also just a nice defensive game from as Tough matchup, you know, on Azari Stevens or Candace Parker or whoever happened to be, you know, because as he kind of slotted between this um, center and power forward, because Seattle doesn't really have a backup power forward on their roster. I don't know. It depends on how you use Gabby Williams, but that's it, you know, <laughs> a discussion for a different day. <laughs> but like, uh, I just thought her room protection was really excellent. One possession where she just like just swallowed up salute, you know, on a, I forget if it was a fast break play or just in the half court, but then. She, you know, just gobbles up this layup attempt and then goes on the other end and scores herself. She was really, really good scoring on Candace Parker, which like Candace had some like LeBron level body language. Uh, and I mean that in the worst way possible. Like I love Candace Parker. I love LeBron James. They have the worst body language on the court. And we were getting so much of Candace, just like supreme frustration every time as he scored on her, what, what a way to just like begin the season. You know, I'm obviously we're two weeks in, but to go up against the defending champs, even without copper and just to like make the statement of, Hey, Brianna Stewart doesn't have a great game because maybe she's a little rusty coming off of the COVID protocol. Sue bird, not a huge scoring game. Jewel Lloyd, not a huge scoring game. Doesn't even matter. Like this player who maybe isn't starting for us when our full lineup is healthy, just drops 21 points, like just rotates to make Rebecca Gardner's life miserable at the rim. I mean, all of these really, really impressive things from Abigor and one player who didn't get an extension, actually. Uh, I'm sure there are cap vagaries for that that makes sense on Seattle's end, but like, this is the kind of player for me I would want to lock down as long as possible. Yeah, I just the way she she plugs the gaps. Yeah, she was everywhere this game. She, she was from a production standpoint, the best player, but also just from a non-number standpoint, she was she was just about everywhere. Like you said, Courtney Vandersloot, one of the, the craftiest players in the W and defensive manipulation, she's a master of. But as he was there every step of the way or as much as one could hope against um, Suit, Candace Parker, Misaman, she was just there. And like, I mean, we can talk about it later, but the five-player unit of... Stewie, Gabby, Ezzy, January, and Jewel, like at the end of the game where they just switched everything. And Chicago, who credit to James Wade, and then, you know, I, I can't speak enough of how, like how great a job he does, like especially with his after timeout plays, which a few of which we'll talk about later. Mm -hmm. But there was nothing there. There was, n <laughs> they got nothing. Yeah. It's, it's fun to watch a team like Seattle that just you think about more of their, their offense and their transition offense. And there were some transition plays that just reminded me of like, oh yeah, this is why I love watching the storm play so much. Like Sue Bird had this one full court pass, like just the length of the way that just lobbed into Ezzy's hands. It's stunning. But yeah, their, their defense with January is really fun. And I, I just wonder how they're going to get all their lineups together because you can't imagine them not closing games with Sue Bird that often because I mean, she's Sue Bird. But the options that they have like I think about if you played Gabby Williams and Steph Talbot together and like Stewie at the five if you just wanted to go super small and like space out teams I mean maybe that could work but I'm I'm intrigued by the the versatility that they have which I wasn't sure about heading into the season but like I mean I mentioned on our notes like the first thing I put in this game was like Steph Talbot sizzle reel because <laughs> like, there's just a lot of really fun things that she did none of which 
it should be noted, involved her explosive first step. Okay, that's fair. Um, she had yeah. a couple of well, she had one crossover in half court where she, I think she found uh, she found a big, but yeah, just the way as I was watching the game, Steph Talbot like was making an impact, making an impact. It wasn't until I re- in the fourth quarter where she she hit her first basket that I realized oh she had not scored yet, which is yeah that was the most insane thing to me. Yeah. I mean, there was a sequence in the second quarter where like she plays post defense on Candace Parker, gets a stop. Then she delivers the ball to Stewie in transition, gets a score. Then she plays defense on Slew, gets a stop. Then there was that crossover that you mentioned. Then she has this nice little cross court pass and transition to Ezzy. I mean, she, you know, a woman after my heart, like has a beautiful seal in transition on Dana Evans and then like draws the foul because can't do anything if you're Dana Evans on her. And then obviously like the two big threes she hits at the start of the fourth quarter. Uh, there was one play in transition defense in the fourth where she just like salute thinks that she has quickly for a wide open three and Talbot just gets out there quick enough that Allie can't get the shot off, which I mean, Allie can get like any shot off. So that was a nice bit of defense. I mean, just everywhere you want her to be on the floor. I, I mean, obviously it's no secret that I'm a huge fan of Steph Talbot's game, but this was a really good night for the, the Talbot heads, you know, among us. Shout out M Adler. Yeah. Yeah, Talbot Hive. It's it's growing. It's it's a thing. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like uh, in addition to Talbot, right? They've got Gabby Williams on the wing, who this was a, a really fun Gabby Williams game because she does a lot of things, and some of which like you you wish she didn't do. <laughs> like, I mean, when when you come up and just like take a pull up jumper and transition, I'm like, that's not why you're here at Gabby Williams. But you know, then she makes up for it by getting that transition block on Slute with. Uh, storm up five in the final minute and she gets that offensive rebound with nine seconds left that really should take care of the game and then dribbles it out bounds but there's there's so much gabby williams going on like the way she can defend all positions like she poked the ball away from azurey stevens on a post up uh, in the first quarter then in the second quarter like she applies like some pressure on salute and just gums up that possession for chicago there's just a lot she can do i think figuring out how to rein her in on offense is still a challenge for Noel and the rest of the Seattle staff, but I like the fit a lot. I think um, just the specificity of her role has to be honed in a little bit. I mean, I agree. I think that has a little bit more to do too with when you have, not to say Mercedes Russell is going to come in and then suddenly Gabby Williams' role is going to be just flattened out or normalized. But when you have players missing who are going to be key players, like certain people end up in certain places where they wouldn't normally. And so Yeah, with Gabby, I think it's more, I mean, with her, with January, with Jewel, in terms of like defense screen navigation, they are three of the best, I think. So defensively, I don't know if it's going to be an offense defense thing because, you know, you expect Sue Bird and her magnificent basketball brain to like figure stuff out defensively. That no look that she threw to Ezzy. Oh my God. (laughs) Yeah. Like she got Candace uh, with it. <laughs> yes, yes, she did. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I could talk about it now, but like one of the things I really enjoy about the Storm offense is what is known as like a gator pass, which is basically when there's a pick and roll happening and the roller is hard rolling, but the pick and roll ball handler can't make the pass to the roller. So they swing it to the wing or, you know, to the slot. And then that person makes that pass. Yeah. When Sue got the chance to do it, she did so in spectacular fashion. Like looking off. I mean, Candace Parker doesn't get got very often with looking elsewhere, but I think Sue got everybody on that. So, yeah. Whoa. It's, I mean, I, I worry that like by choosing Storm Sky as our first game of the week, we've eliminated like the very best to watch on <laughs> some level because the the level that these two teams can function offensively is just so pretty at times. I mean, Chicago wasn't quite there, but there were some sets where like, I just watched the end of it and I was like, how did that player get so open? (laughs) Like, I don't understand how that happened. It's like, oh yeah, that's just really, really good action from Chicago. I mean, a couple of their ATOs at the end, I'm sure we'll, we'll get to in a certain, in a bit, but I just, I like watching high level basketball. And we got a lot of that from, from Ezzy, from Talbot, um, even from Stevens, like Azari Stevens defensively, is just really, really like, I think underrated. I mean, we talk a lot about Candace Parker. I'm for one, I'm very excited that uh, Chicago has kept their defensive playbook from last year's playoffs and just kept going with it to start this regular season. Cause we didn't see this level of 
pressure on the ball and this level of high hedging during the regular season. Like that was something that definitely came out against, I think Connecticut really, but it's nice to see that still going. And when you have the activity of your bigs, like Candace and Azure, who can play that style, um, it definitely makes those decisions easier when you're James Wade. Like you can, you can keep doing that over the course of a 36 game regular season, but yeah, she had a, just some really nice defensive possessions on Ezzy, which is an uh, interesting thing to say when, you know, Magor did score her career high in this game, but like it wasn't entirely a function of Ezra Stevens. A lot of that came on other players, but like there was one pick and roll where, you know, she gets beat on one possession and the very next play, like as he tries the same role and as just like blocks the shit out of her. And then, you know, down in the fourth quarter, like she gets the matchup on Magor, stop on one and score on the other. There was one play where, Magbagor, you know, delivers that pass to Rashonda Gray that we were talking about earlier. Within five seconds, Azari Stevens scored on the other side of the floor. Five seconds. Like I had to look at the box score play by play because the broadcast did not get to it fast enough. I was like, what happened? I was, oh, Azari Stevens was just there already. So I think her growth is what excites me a lot about Chicago because, you know, they have a lot of players who are on the other side of their primes, but her and Copper just this like limitless physical potential and then watching them grow in real time is is pretty exciting. Candice, Miesemann, Salute, those three, but the best player on the floor in this game, in my opinion, was Azrae Stevens. Like that's, I mean, that's huge. And, you know, we talked about this during the playoffs, but like Candice taking her under her wing and just like continuing to, I you know, I'm not saying we're going to be seeing the next Candice Parker, but like in terms of like making the reads that Candace makes on defense and the ability to cover the ground that she does, it's not something you can necessarily teach, but since the tools are there, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, she was able to like shore up some of Candace's defensive deficiencies as the season goes on, because, you know, the body does wear down a little bit for vets. So if Azure can make up that ground, I mean, I don't, don't see the sky really slowing down. Yeah. I, I had fun watching Candace still play that super aggressive style of defense. I thought she looked better, honestly, out on the perimeter in this game than she did just one-on-one in the post against Mag before, which is, is not how I thought her game was going to age, but she's just so smart that like playing that really aggressive, like trapping style, it, she, she can still figure out like how much she needs to move to make these things work. Um, whereas like the one-on-one post thing, it's, it's not really my thing anymore. It's just, oh, as can spin past me now and uh, that wasn't the thing that used to happen when I wasn't 35 years old. Um, yeah, I agree. I think um, still a very functional passer and I guess the best way to like, and, and finisher. Um, so I teased a little bit earlier that, you know, I could talk about a few sets. The Storm, um, very interesting to watch on offense, but that's more about flow and, you know, th- we can do a breakdown another time, but I wanted to break down three sets from the sky that like, if you follow me on Twitter, I guess you've seen before, but like James Wade is great. So I'm going to keep breaking them down. Okay. So the first one is actually their first offensive possession. This game it's um, I wouldn't necessarily call this a, a post split stagger. So Ali Quigley is on the left wing and Emma Miesemann gets the ball entered to her like free throw line extended, but typically it's a little deeper. And then the post split happens, which is what um, Candace and Allie do here. And then they stagger. So it's an option for Azrae Stevens, those two screens. So if she uses both, she can come off of a handoff from Mies and then like chaos will ensue. But in this particular case, it bends the defense in a really difficult way. So as you can see here, Gabby Williams is in a super difficult spot. Is she going to leave Courtney Vandersloot or rotate all the way over to stop the roller? She just happens to be like one of the only people that can cover this much ground, cause a deflection. Or actually, Julia does a great job getting back and tipping it away. Between the two of them, they stop this action. I don't know many other teams that would be able to in that way. I've definitely tweeted about this before. It's a, it's a James Wade favorite. Double stagger for Azra here. All three bigs are involved, but normally this is action where it's copper getting to go downhill. But, you know, as she is not here yet, the ball is swung across and then it's Miami, which is a dribble handoff into a ball screen. Ali decides to reverse the ball instead of using the Mies ball screen. And then it turns into a Slute Candice step up pick and roll with the entire lane completely emptied out. And because it's Ali quickly 
may be coming off that screen because it's Emma Mieseman. Like you can't just leave them. So Candace gets the tough finish here. And then the very last one is, like I said, James Wade, master of the ATO after timeout. So a minute and a half left in the game. They go with this zipper action on the sideline out of bounds. And then it's window dressing, I guess, the Emma Mieseman action. But Ali Quigley looks to set a ball screen for Courtney Vandersloot and then ghosts it and then flares off this Candace Parker screen. But instead of setting the actual screen, Candace slips to the basket. And Sloot is a master of selling this action. So Sloot is staring a hole down. Ali Quigley's way, so everyone's looking, but Candace with the slip is able to beat Ezzy, lay up James Wade, just a master, just a master. Yeah, that was my favorite play of the whole game. I think just I watched it and I at the end I was like, okay, um, why is Candace this wide open? They had to rewind. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's it's a lot. I mean, I watched it the first time and I was like, oh yeah, so it's you know they used Ali's gravity mm-hmm. on the double stagger to to get that opening but I missed her ghosting the initial screen and right, I think that's right. what made it all work. Yeah. yeah. Um, when you talked about like Courtney, just like looking a hole into Allie Quigley's direction, it reminded me of uh, it's completely unrelated, but uh, this story that was in sports illustrated last week about couples in the WNBA who are on the same teams. <laughs> and um, there's this like great quote from Kurt Miller. It was just like, Hey, you notice certain things like, do they drive into practice together today? Are they sitting together on the bus? <laughs> like, how are things going between them? <laughs> it's just, I'm thinking of how many times does Courtney Vandersloot look off Ellie quickly? <laughs> I mean, to that point, I think my favorite thing from um, the championship run is when one of them makes a, a defensive mistake and the other one has to cover. It's, it's like a very aggressive eye roll and then, you know, covering for your teammate in a way that like, you would with any teammate obviously sure. it's a it's a defensive mistake but it's just you know it's just that feeling as a viewer of like oh yeah they're gonna hear about it later they're <laughs> definitely gonna hear about it later i can't wait for copper to come back and just uh fill in the pieces here do you so if you're james wade which i know is like a dream of yours evan uh who would you start i don't know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um so i mean the most fun would be this like ravenous, hyper big lineup of just Sloot as the smallest player. And then, and then Copper at the two. Yeah. But I, I don't know how sustainable that is. Yeah. And Ali is just so important to what they do as well. I mean, you can't bench Misaman, but like, if you were me, I would start Stevens and Parker as the bigs. But I think they're going to start Parker and Misaman as the bigs. I mean, it would, it makes sense because, you know, Azure is just like the level of force and physicality is imagine you're the other team and you have to deal with, um, just, uh, she, she won many, many, many more trophies after, uh, finals MVP. Um, Copper, right? Yeah. 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 But Euro like, league I was MVP, just, Spanish league MVP, Spanish yeah, league I was finals just say MVP. Multiple yeah. league MVP. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody who's holding that many awards, just like just relentlessly driving at you and then in transition. And then, you know, as we saw in that playoff run, just never seems to get tired. And then yeah. you bring Azrae in and it's just like the same thing, but from a big position, it's just, there's so much force. And then you take it easy. And, oh, that's one thing I forgot to um, point out is that one of the biggest things that I've seen James Wade use to deploy Emma Mieseman is just, they just have somebody zipper right off of her which is she's standing on the low block and then somebody who's in the same side corner just like comes up and off the action off it's super simple but hyper effective in that it gets me more space than she otherwise would have and if you don't respect it then like whoever's coming off might be coming open but yeah yeah i think i would just want to see like two of me and parker and salute on the court at all times just for the passing um, I'm not, I'm not sold on Dana Evans yet as a distributor. So I think whatever way you can manipulate the rotations to make sure you have enough ball handling, enough facilitating out on the court. I think that's what I'd want to see. Cause like Stevens to me is not that type of player, uh, more, more of the finisher than the creator. So I think that's why I like her better with the starters than with the second, you know, but it doesn't really matter so long as you're mixing and matching the right way. 
And, you know, on that note of mixing and matching, I was very happy in the Seattle game that there were no minutes without the big three on the court because you and I had talked about that Storm Aces game from week one. And I counted, uh, let me pull up my notes real quick. This take just one second. Um, how many minutes were there? Uh, 339 and then, yeah. So there were uh, almost eight minutes of no Stewie, Lloyd, and Bird on the court together in that Aces game, which thankfully did not happen against Chicago. And what do you know? Oh, <laughs> Noel Quinn, adjustments. Adjustments. So week three of the WNBA season coming up. Uh, the Sparks play the Storm tonight, but that game will probably have finished before this episode comes out. So as far as what I am looking forward to, I missed the home opener of Sparks um, season because I was in Canada. So I'm very excited for when they finally do play at home because I just think that there's, I don't know. I'm excited to see the team in person. You know, I like Katie Lou. I love watching Lexi Brown. That's been a delightful um, fun fact. When the Sparks traded for Alexis Jones at the start of the 2019 season, they traded Odyssey Sims to Minnesota for Alexis Jones for like 15 minutes. I thought it was Lexi Brown instead of Alexis Jones. And I was inordinately excited. <laughs> and then I found out it was Alexis Jones and uh, less so. But Lexi Brown, Duke Blue Devil, Spark. I mean, this is this is a gimme, you know, and she's playing really well. So I mean one could say that she sparks joy. Yeah, one could say. <laughs> is there anything else you're looking forward to? I mean, obviously the return of Clea Copper, just to see what happens in Chicago with that. Um, whenever Mercedes Russell returns from this nebulous uh, injury that has kept her out. Um, always excited to see Seattle at full strength. And then uh, just how long the Aces can keep this offensive run going, you know, um, for them to start the Bill Lambeer night with uh, three pointers on consecutive possessions was a uh, hilarious, but I mean, we've, we've said this for a very long time. Like the Aces have so much talent and that starting five is I think pretty comfortably the best starting five in the WNBA. Um, just how long can they keep it going? Evan, what are you looking forward to this upcoming week? I am looking forward to watching the team in my market, the Mystics. Rui Machida, it's been terrific. I don't know, if, I don't know how Incredible. much you've watched of her, but like, oh, whoa. That one game they played against the Lynx without Elena Deladon, um, some of the passes that she made to Cloud in that game, buttes. Surprised we went this long without talking about the Mystics. They've been excellent. <laughs> They have been, but I mean, you know. Something to look forward to, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. You have to leave stuff on the table. Mm -hmm. Just like Bill Ambeer did. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, okay, we'll leave it, we'll leave it here. But um, if you, the viewer, have not seen it yet, um, at the end of the game, Asia Wilson went over to Bill Ambeer and was very excited very happy she screamed bill right and you know a couple more players came over the entire starting lineup comes over yeah yeah the entire starting lineup comes over um something for the viewers to look at is um my question is like was the kelsey plum interaction awkward because <laughs> i thought it was a little awkward so yeah so i think i think we'll leave you with that yeah that has been episode one of this season of The Step Through. Make sure you're back next week as we talk about more W. It's going to be great. <laughs> Bye.